Cutting down and processing trees may sound like a simple task. But for the timber faller, each tree is a potential killer. Widowmaker, a tree that will kill you and make your wife a widow. And the powerful chainsaws they work with can amputate a limb in a second. When you cut your leg with a chainsaw, it kind of just grinds it up. The rigging crews that hook up the logs to be dragged out of the slopes have to be on guard constantly. Some can actually be very, very sharp, very, very solid, and they can actually impale your body. Logging is one of the riskiest jobs in North America and accounts for more deaths than any other profession on the continent. Four years ago, I got hit pretty good with a tree. I thought I was done for. Last year in the United States alone, over 80 loggers lost their lives on the job. Danger zone. On flat ground, most of the logging is done by highly rapid machines. But these machines are useless on steep canyons. Logging on slopes is still done by fearless men called skyline loggers. The United States, with 750 million acres of woodland, has the fourth largest amount of forest in the world. Half of the 28 million acres of Oregon are covered by forests, and a quarter are owned by commercial landowners. These landowners hire one of 1,100 logging companies in the state, who then contract loggers. In the eastern part of the state, many families live off the forest. The loggers here work year-round, often at high elevations in the canyons of the Wallowa Mountains. At the foot of the mountains in the town of Joseph, experienced timber faller Rick Jones prepares the blades of his chainsaw almost every night. He sharpens his blades with precision to make sure they will cut efficiently the next day on the job. Rick gets paid according to the number of trees he cuts down in a day. So the more trees he cuts, the more money he will bring back home to his family. I kiss my wife and my son good, you know, goodbye in the morning, and I want to come home safe. Every morning before the sun rises, Rick picks up his partner, Kelly Couch, and makes the 40-minute drive up into the mountains to their work site. Do you hear anything about the weather, Kelly? It's unseasonably warm. Damn fog. On these roads, you just want to watch out for log trucks. I think we'll be getting above this fog, don't you, Kelly? As soon as they've driven above the clouds, the fog clears out. Their work site is in Tope Creek at an elevation of 4,400 feet. It's kind of nice having Kelly around. It's probably safer. You know, I don't have to push it so hard. Rick drops off Kelly on the south side of the canyon so that he is far enough away to make sure the trees he's cutting won't fall on his partner. Rick needs a lot of equipment to be able to cut trees. He puts on a back harness full of gear, including a radio for communication in case he has an accident. He also needs to load up with jugs of gasoline, oil, and water. His heavy chainsaw has a three and a half foot blade. Including the safety padding under his clothes, he carries close to 50 pounds of extra weight every day. Rick has 26 years of experience as a timber faller. Here he is doing a partial cut, which will allow the remaining trees to regenerate themselves without having to replant more trees. For the last 20 years, he has been working for a logging company from Enterprise called Big Time Operators. The company owner, Mike Wiedemann, is always the first and last man on site every working day. 
We're gonna go right up there by where that, just this side where that deck is. Yeah. It's the next skylight look. I'll get that cut out. Where's, where's the Kelly guy going? Is he in the back end? He's staying back there and I'm just gonna stay on this side. Rick always needs to stay ahead of the rigging crew who extract the logs he cuts. He needs to cut at a fast pace. I can't think of anything else around here that I could do that I'd like more. Not that I'm not a people person, but I don't have to deal with the public. I mean, you know, I go out and work by myself, and uh, I kind of really like that aspect of my job. On an average day, he can cut down over 200 trees. But in the winter, he will cut less since it's harder to move around on the snow-covered slope. The chainsaw produces excessive vibration and noise, so earplugs are necessary to avoid damaging a logger's hearing. To cut down trees, there is an efficient, time-proven method. First, with his chainsaw, Rick does a notch called a side cut on the side facing the direction he wants the tree to fall. He always has to watch over his head as he cuts. Then he does a back cut behind the tree. Once the tree is almost cut, the weight of the tree makes it fall in the direction of the side cut, away from him. I like the challenge, the physical aspect of it, and uh, I like the danger, the risk. Kind of keeps life interesting. It was about 12 years ago, I was following a, a fairly good size tamarack, and you can see how the limbs are up in them, like that, spindly. And I had to wedge it. It was probably a four-foot tree. And I was wedging on it, and a chunk of snow broke out with a limb stuck in it, hit me in the head, cracked two of my teeth in half. In East Oregon, the forests have a lot of dead or dying trees called snags. These snags can fall very easily over unsuspecting loggers. What I got going here is I've got a tree I need to fall, and it's got three uh, tamarack snags in front of it, and have grown into it and died and I need to make sure all those trees go down together. And hopefully it's not rotten on the stump. It could be rotten up high, and, and when it starts to fall, the top would snap out of it and come back. That's why I'm gonna push it over with that green tree. Hopefully it all stays together. Rick proceeds first by only cutting side cuts in the trees, one by one. He moves slowly from tree to tree, hoping they aren't going to fall too early. This technique is called the domino, and it's not recommended unless it's absolutely necessary. It's risky because while you are pre-cutting the trees, they could suddenly all come crashing down on you. another snag right here, leaning into that tree. Even though this isn't a very big tree, I mean, ask any log, log cutter, you're just as dead from something small as big, so it doesn't matter. Four years ago, I got hit pretty good with a tree. I could see it was above me, and I just looked down and thought, I'm done for it. And it come down and hit me in the chest, ripped my shirt, my pants, and I fell down, and then it kind of come down on top of me. And uh, it hit me hard enough that I, th I thought I was dead. And I actually, I broke my wrist in six places and broke my navicular bone. And I, I did this job sawing timber for five months with a cast on my arm. And uh, responsibility I felt at work, I didn't want somebody to take my job and I, I wanted the rigging crew to stay ahead of me. Because the two timber fallers both logged 25 foot wide corridors on each slope of the canyon, the rigging crew can move their skyline in a parallel manner. This allows them to extract the logs on both slopes at the same time. The two-ton carriage rolls down on the skyline to the riggers down below in the canyon. The skidding line of the carriage rolls down. The rigging slinger unhooks the three choker lines 
and the choker setter then walks in the brush to locate three logs to hook up. The loggers have to walk carefully through the cut timber because it is unstable ground. Once three logs are choked, the rigging slinger hooks the three lines back to the skidding line. And through a whistle communication system between the yarder and the rigging crew, the carriage pulls the logs up to the landing. This whistle here is a whistle to the yarder. I'll blow a stop. And then I'll unclamp the car with three whistles. It unclamps. And then I give Dan two. And that's Huppo on the skidding line. Once the timber has arrived at the landing, the processor operator unhooks the chokers. The yarder operator then sends the carriage back down the canyon to the rigging crew. While they work below, the processor operator removes the limbs from the timber and measures the logs to length. Meanwhile, Rick's partner, Kelly, is working on the other side of the canyon. He also has his share of snags to deal with. Kelly is 50 years old and has been a timber faller for over 30 years. Sometimes when I wake up in the morning, I can hardly wait to get there. But sometimes when I know it's not a very good patch of timber, the ground's pretty tough or whatever, you're not always as excited. I like being out. There's all these little snags and leaners hanging around in here, and uh, they're not very safe to work around. Even though they're not very big, it doesn't take something very big to put a knot on your head, so best way to do is try to get rid of them first. knocked them down. When the back cut does not move the tree forward, you need a wedge to lift the tree slightly so it falls in the desired direction. It's got to be alive. I had a a top fall out of another tree that I didn't notice. And uh, I just happened to look up at the time that it hit me and it drove a branch down through this area. It went down through my eye socket, down into my sinuses, and uh, well, they flew me to the hospital and they took it out. With safety glasses on, you feel like you're running around blind because they really restrict your vision from glare to dust to um, sweat, ice, fog. No one's come up with a good safety glass. These snags have no limbs left on them, and dead trees are often very fragile. It could fall. Guy don't want to be working around something that you know it could get you, even though that's not very big. It's big enough to get you, so. The vibration from his chainsaw could break off the treetop, 
and a spear-shaped piece of timber could fall down and impale the logger. That side tree wasn't supposed to fall down. Kelly luckily got out of there in time. Suddenly, the roots of the tree he has his hands on lets go. He has seen this happen before. You can see right here all the roots are rotted off of it, and uh, there's nothing left to hold it. It could have been a close call. Meanwhile, the riggers keep hooking up logs. OK, that's live. On this lift, the logs are out of control. They are spread out, making it dangerous for the men down below. When logs swing like this, you have to keep your distance. The spread logs also put extra pressure on the skyline. Rick hears a bad noise. I think my car just fell out of the sky, Rick. Skyline break? Uh, yeah, I'd say a long splash probably uh, came undone. Roger. Luckily, no one was standing or working under the skyline and its two-ton carriage. They would have been crushed. If line breaks, if you're standing in the way, hell, you get hit. <laughs> well, it kind of goes like in a phone cord. Sometimes it'll just go everywhere. The Skyline cable is temporarily spliced together, but Mike will have to buy a new cable for tomorrow. Got to cook our soup. It's mid-afternoon and the hard-working riggers are getting hungry. While the riggers wait for dinner, they hook up another load. Yeah, you got wet feet. <laughs> 15-pound boots turned into about 45. <laughs> we'll go ahead and eat. Well, he got hit with a skyline here, what, <laughs> five, six months ago, broke his collarbone. He was out for three months. And what was it? About four years ago, me and him both got hit by the same log. Put us out for about a week. Take a lick and keep on ticking. <laughs> I've seen three deaths in the woods. Most of them are all preventable. One was just guiding the lines on the drum. The guy just, the stick broke and he fell into the drum. The other ones were all hit by logs, standing in the wrong spot. That's why when we tell you guys to take a couple extra steps back, because you never know when they're going to spin around. And it happens just like that. One of the chasers that works up on the land, you unbelling chokers, Turn was coming in. Garter engineer looked over to see if the chaser was out of the way. He was. Looked away to land the turn. Well, the chaser had walked in for some reason. Turn logs landed on him, and he's paralyzed from the neck down now. Just mashed him. When I worked here about seven years ago, we well, reached down to undo the, the shackle. And normally, you can't pull them out by hand. Well, it was all wrapped around the tree, so I reached down there. Undid the molly, pulled the pin out, and when I pulled the pin out, it just come un unwrapped around those trees, and I jumped backwards, and it hit me right here, sliced me from there, and... <clears throat> but I didn't even have a chance to get out of the way. I mean, it, it, if it happens, it happens that fast. When we use a cat for a tail hold, you run the skyline over the blade and under and hook it to the back of the cat, and for some reason, it pulled and it ripped the cat in half. I was standing on the deck of the cat when it went. So I hit the ground, and I just got on the radio and said, man down. I punctured my lung and broke my back. So man got to make a living somehow. Rick has finished his work day and parks his chainsaw in a tree. 
he heads off home to his family. You line up this V yeah. with the front sight. Rick likes to spend time with his son, Grant. Aha! Did I hit something? You hit it. This looks really good. So how long is your drive? Well, it takes about 45 minutes. Well, that's a lot better than what you were driving. Yep, it beats a lot better than, uh, what was that other job taking, two? I think about two hours and 20 minutes one way. Nice. Did the bear attack you? No bears, Grant. It's winter time. Where do the bears go in winter? To hibernate. They hibernate. They hibernate. What about cougars? Cougars? Well, I haven't seen one since that last one attacked me. <laughs> On this day, it's raining as Rick and Kelly go to work in the Wallowa Mountains. At an altitude of 4,400 feet, the rain quickly turns into snow. Rick drives to the back of the canyon to his work site. The snow has stopped falling. Rick's visibility is back to normal. What I do when I walk down my strips is I, like, scope it out look for hazards I'm going to be working back into, like seeing snags, kind of just making a mental note of it. So when I work back up the hill, I know what to expect. As soon as Rick starts his saw, the riggers know he is nearby. A bit of chewing tobacco and he's ready to go down the slope, where he will then start his logging strip, working uphill. He finds more dead trees. A couple more white fur snags. We'll leave that tree, try to sneak it past that little leaf tree and hope it don't fill full, full of limbs come shooting back at me. Rick's prediction was right. He watches as a shower of tree limbs comes falling down. These slanted trees want to fall uphill. He wedges his frozen tree to try to change the direction of the fall. Set back on me. Watch this. this. If it's frozen, this wedge can come shooting out of like a bullet. Oh, man. Come on. Hopefully, it'll stay on the stump. Go where I want it. The wedge flies out, luckily in the opposite direction. It's frozen. There it goes. Not good. Watch it. A small tree gets caught up. You see that tree bent over? Big hazard. You wouldn't want to go walking by it. If you stuck a chainsaw in that it, and you didn't notice it, it'd just explode on you. Had a little sapling bent over like that was summertime. It was down under a tree, and uh, he was bucking the log and he didn't see it, it tore his whole face off. Rick's saw chain becomes loose. I'm gonna tighten up a little bit before it goes flying off. If it flies off, it's down low, it can you know, end up in your legs. When you're up here like this, it can end up in your face. I've been cut with chains that have broken, come around loaded and slap me in the leg and, and done some damage that way. This is a perfect situation. I've had it happen to me. Trees close together. Only time you really have to worry about your bar tip 
bar tip is called a kickback. When you stick it through and it catches something in the wrong angle, instead of going pulling into the wood, it actually catches the tip and kick back out around like that. When I got sawed, that's what happened. When you cut your leg with a chainsaw, it kind of just grinds it up and there's no smooth edges. And I watched her for a good hour and a half trying to sew my leg up. And when she'd pull the knots tight, it'd just rip out. Rick has to be very careful here. The top of this snag could easily snap off. One fatal miscalculation and he could be crushed. Makes it fun. Well, you don't want to hit it more than once without looking up. His eyes get full of sawdust. Finally, the snag lets go. The forest here is not only full of snags. Gold pine, they call them around here. It's probably close to 100 feet tall. When a tree is too long and heavy to be brought up safely on the skyline, the logger cuts it into shorter logs. Rick bucks the tree to the log length asked by the timber mill. Been a real productive day. I'm still alive. He meets his partner, Kelly, who walked around the canyon to find him and head home. How'd it go today, Kelly? It's another day in paradise, Rick. You get any of those nasty white fur, big old lemmy snags? Uh, not too many. I only, only had one or two. Really? Saw's running good, though. Yeah. Rick has his weekends off and likes to bring his son Grant to his grandfather's farm, where they load up the hay for the cows. These days away from the forest re-energizes the logger for the work week ahead. What do you think about what I do for a living? I think it's really cool and awesome. You do? You want to do that when you grow up? Yeah. I hope not. I would like to do that someday. I think he's probably like a lot of kids that think their dad's great and can do anything and maybe Superman. I'd like to work on my chainsaw. I don't want him growing up to do what I do. Not that if he couldn't do it physically, mentally, whatever. I've had a lot of close calls that, through the years that I just, I wouldn't want him to be what I am. I really wouldn't. There has been a decrease in the number of loggers coming into the field because of how dangerous the work is. And few loggers want their children to follow in their footsteps. But in McMinnville in West Oregon, we find a young man who's a fourth generation logger. Kirk Luato is 25 years old and the son of a logging company owner. He has studied forestry and might eventually run his father's company if things work out. There's something about logging that, that gets in your blood. It's kind of like you have sawdust or you have just the wood chips in your veins that you just you just yearn for it, you just need it. Their logging site is at an elevation of 2,000 feet, and you can barely see the top of the 75-foot yarder. But the show must go on, and he needs to move the skyline. As the supervisor of the rigging crew, Kirk coordinates the new layout path for the skyline cable. He uses a less heavy hay wire as the temporary line. He uses the skidder's drum to spindle up the hay wire. There's a jagger up in here, 
and I'm holding on real tight, chances are it could take my glove, my hand, put me through the arch and into the drum, so. Something sometimes you don't always think about, but. Unlike the East Oregon loggers who were logging between canyons, the loggers at this site are skyline logging on only one slope. The land formation here allows them to keep the yarder in its high central location. I'll have the haywire, which I just loaded on the skitter. I'll have the haywire going from here all the way to the yarder. There's so many stobs out here. With some help from the crew, Kirk will have to manually drag 200-foot sections of haywire to join them all together. The total distance to cover between the yarder and the tailhold anchor is 1,500 feet. As the forest here will be completely replanted, the logging company is mandated to do a clear cut, which makes it quite laborious moving over the higher number of cut logs. Kirk needs to finish laying the remaining haywire sections down to the tail end. But to be able to do that, he will first have to walk across a large pond as this water habitat is protected and cannot be logged. The water is freezing. How deep is it? It's pretty deep. No, we're not cut across. Okay, keep feeding me line. So trying to move my legs is an incredible task. I try not to fall over. If I get stuck in there, if I could have a really hard time getting out. Could possibly end up being underwater for a little bit to just try to get my boots off. Kirk has enough haywire line to be able to throw it to his partner on the edge of the pond. I'm freezing, freezing cold. I'll try to keep it nice and loose for you. He will drag the haywire line to the tail hold while Kirk finds his way out of the pond. Did you bring a change of clothes with you? Yeah, I do. All right, that's line, Kirk. Is that line? Yeah, that's mine. Okay. I am very cold. I am frozen. I'm going to go ahead on the yarder whistles to signal to him to go ahead and start pulling um, his haywire back up to the yarder. It will send the skyline back out through the unit, back out to the cap. There it goes, it's cleared up. The skyline is pulled in. Right now, there's quite a bit of pressure on the haywire. We gotta be really careful working. This is called being in the bite. If anybody's in there, it's actually very, very dangerous. I'm gonna start up the cat here. I'm gonna park it behind something sturdy enough, like a stump. Um, and then dig it in. I'm gonna dig the tracks in so that we're a secure anchor. Now that I have the cat in position, I'm gonna go ahead and give him the yarder whistles to go ahead and pick up the skyline. And hopefully it's gonna clear up everything. The yarder tower pulls in the 1,500 foot long skyline, suspending it until it becomes rigid. If this skyline or if the shackle or if the strap or eye were to break right now, it could probably kill one of us. And that's it. We're ready to log. OK, Bill. Go ahead, sit the skyline down, put the car back on. All right. We're going to get the car on. 
Kirk is joined by the entire rigging crew. This top-of-the-line remote-control sky carriage weighs two and a half tons. The carriage is raised and the riggers can now go down in the brush. Right now I'm not walking on any solid ground at all. Right now, he's, he's getting the right angle on this so that A, it doesn't come back and hit us, it won't swing into us at all, and B, that it goes out smoothly. Being out here long enough, you actually learn those angles without even without even realizing it. It's almost like a game of pool. You, you start to just, you start to just see your shot, and you start to see your next shot and shot after that. Yeah, you're free. The choker setter searches for log trunks under the brush. Come on, Milo, hurry up. My grandma's faster than you. At the landing, the chaser runs over to unhook the logs. But on this load, the lines get stuck between the logs. Before he gets hurt, he signals the yarder for help. Turn comes in, you gotta watch for logs moving around. Uh, a lot of times when they set down on the ground, they'll still roll. You gotta watch out for that. You gotta watch out for the machines. Because the machine, if he doesn't see you, he can easily come around, hit you. Uh, go watch out for lines. So one line breaks or anything like that going out there. Uh, we lift the chokers up. They're very easily they swing back and hit you. At Kirk's house, Jenna, who's pregnant, prepares a late supper for her husband. I know that this is a passion of mine, and I just, I want to take everything that I know now and just keep learning every day from the older generation. I could never ask him to not do it. It, it would take away definitely a part of who he is. So, um, and that wouldn't be fair. So I uh, accept it, and I, I vented to his mom several times who she's been through this before. And I remember the first time he works, you know, goes to bed so early, and she goes, "Oh, in a few years you'll you'll like that aspect of it." Kirk's always said he wants me to have six boys so he can have his own crew, but <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> be nice. No, it would not be nice. <laughs> the next morning, it is pouring rain. Bob Luato, the company owner and Kirk's father, arrives on the work site. He trusts his son to get the ball rolling each day before he gets here, but nevertheless also enjoys teasing him. How long are you going to be here? I thought that you were going to be done already. Yeah, Kirk, I'm ready to go. Well, I hope Kirk will eventually be able to take over the company and, and, and do what I did with my dad and my dad allowed me to do, was to kind of come in and take over the business and, and start running it, and that's why I've got him doing what he's doing to be able to train him to take over and, and learn how to run a company. 
I know that my dad, he, he's always expressed how happy he has been uh, that I've actually decided to come into the logging industry. So far, he's, he's working hard at it. He's uh, still got some stuff to learn, but he's doing good. Even if it's wet and miserable in the forest, skyline loggers cannot let their guards down. You can slip off and hurt yourself. You can slip, fall on the, what we call these stobs. They may seem pretty weak, but some can actually be very, very sharp, and very, very solid, and they can actually impale your body. When a log lift looks unsafe, they take cover behind trees. Without everybody working together, we, we can't accomplish anything. My goal is to try to get done with that job as fast and efficient as possible. But every day without an accident or without an injury is an accomplishment for me. I see this other log sitting next to it. I'm gonna get what's called a bonus. So I'm gonna choke both of them together. So we're both both at the same time. Even with only three choker lines, sometimes extra logs can be lifted. Sometimes the choke will come loose. Sometimes it can actually come unbuild. The log that I bonused with it, if that was choked individually, and I had, let's say, a long end, if this log happened to hit this duff log or a stump, it hit, the butt would hit it, and it would actually, in turn, lift the top end of it over your head and it'd swing it around whichever way. You never know when a log will escape the cable rigging, but you know it can always be fatal. In situations like this, Troy and I, we've been trained to face about 45 degrees, so we're, we're able to look at the turn going in, and we're able to look at where the turn came from. We always try to place ourselves in a situation where we can actually run to get out of the way. Like when they cut a chunk of a log off for whatever reason, sometimes it'll roll back down again. Like there's one sitting right up there, but it's it's long wise, so it won't roll at us. But I've had stuff roll down. I've I've had tops come over at me. I've had sticks come at me. Logs. Yeah, it's just everyday thing. <laughs> and I've been hit in the face with those when they're swinging. They hit you in the face. I had my eye cut open. I got hit in the mouth. The men are cold and wet, but waterproof gloves would be too slippery to work with. I love my job, I love my job, I love my job, I love my job. A couple minutes and they're soaked. Troy, who's now on the other side of the logged corridor, warns the men about a difficult choke. Hey, my lot's been top of head soaked here, so watch your ass. All right. He choked a few trees at the end of the log. And what's gonna happen is they're gonna come out top ahead. So basically, big bushy end is gonna come swing around back at us. So I'm gonna stand right here and I'm gonna be careful. I'm gonna give him the go ahead sign. And I'm gonna keep an eye on him. That was a good job, Troy. Good job. Bill, this is going to be the last turn. Last turn, Bill. Bringing the guys closer together, being able to work hard as a team, and getting done at the end of the day and go, being able to go home to the ones we love, that's an accomplishment that I have. 
The skyline is brought down for the night. My dad still does log some, by the way. He's still at 77. He's still working. Oh, my God. Kirk's grandfather is a retired logger who is still very active. Kirk has also learned a lot about logging from him. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe his grandfather could also give him a few tips on bowling. So how did uh, you do on bowling last night? Uh, we won all three games. Okay, good. Yeah, Grandpa turned it up at the very end. Did he uh, get your, his money from you? He always gets his money from me. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that he was doing his job. He, he was. Yeah, yeah. so you, you, need a, you need a raise now, huh? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Being the son of a logger, especially the man who owns the company is a hard thing to do. And Kirk's risen to the occasion. I say now I worry more about my son than my husband. I worried about Bob when we were first married. It was very scary. He would come home and tell me tales. And oftentimes it was, I almost got killed today. And it came from this side and it hit me and it knocked me out. And right in here is what actually cut my eye. Uh, I cut it about an inch wide. Cut about an inch wide all along my eyebrow and I I actually thought I was going to lose my eye, but uh, the Riggin Slinger at the time, uh, I woke up and he had a sweatshirt pressed as hard as he could over my forehead and he was able to get the bleeding stopped. A month and a half into marriage, that was kind of a shocker. So I, I really try not to think about it. I don't go up to the job and watch him. I know if there's been times I've come home from work and I don't even notice it. My wife sees my legs or something. She just like freak out, like, where did that come from? And I didn't even know I had it. I worry about my husband all the time. He is, he's very good at what he does. He has many years of experience, but it's still a very dangerous job. A man's got to know his own limitations. I think I know mine. Bob brings his son Kirk to their next job, which is on the edge of a challenging cliff. On the map, it looked like there was a few cliffs in this corner. Yeah, there's a cliff, and it's probably about uh, 80, 90 percent ground. It's just okay. like this. So it goes over and just curls. And no roads to the back? I gotta uh, walk back you got to walk about 1,000, 1,200 feet down mm -hmm. off the top of the roads. Up there. So okay. It looks good. Uh, nice timbers. Challenging. Challenging. Uh, that's what's great about logging. Every unit is different. That's right, it is. Every job loggers work on is different different locations, different terrains, and different trees. They must be ready for whatever comes up next. Back home, Rick tells his family where his next job will be. We're supposed to move to that, that new job as mm -hmm. soon as the snow's melted. My drive will be about two and a half hours to the motel, and then probably another hour after that. Oh, so you'll be staying over there? Yeah right when baseball season is going to start. For so many years, we've been labeled as bad people or people that don't care, lumberjacks that just rape the land and leave nothing left to grow. But I truly believe that I care more than anybody else out there about the environment. I do care what's gonna be left for my children. My job's not all about making money. It's, it's about, you know, making a better forest. We're not going to cut any more than what we harvest, and we're gonna plant more than what we harvest every year. Trees are just a crop, basically, and, and you just have to manage them over a long period of time, and sustainable forestry does that. Oregon was the first state in the country to adopt an Environmental Forest Practices Act, and has served as a model to other states and abroad. Kirk's wife, accompanied by her mother-in-law, comes to the work site for the first time. It is the first time I've been up here and watched it all happen, so it's pretty cool to see what he talks about all day. Loggers are a brave, fearless, and resilient breed of workers. Logging is extremely physical, dirty, and high-risk work, but it's also very rewarding. Sure, they'll admit it's a dangerous job, but they're glad to be the ones to do it. Thank you.